Okay. All right, looks like we have a good number of you joining the webinar today. Really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Cristian Caballero. I work with Texas Appleseed as a community outreach coordinator. Uh, our organization is a partner of the Texas Coalition of on Cohort, Cohorts Debt. Uh, thanks for joining the TCCD webinar on Cohorts Debt and uh, COVID-19. While we introduce the webinar, I would like to start a poll so we can get to know uh, everybody that's logged on right now uh, viewing this webinar. Uh, so as I start this poll right now, please select an option that best describes uh, your work or your occupation. Um, the poll will be live in about one second. All right, there it is, it's live. So please choose uh, whichever job description or background uh, describes you the most. And this will just give us a good idea of who our audience is, um, you know, obviously what your background is and your interest might be. Um, and then hopefully in the future we can tailor uh, additional webinars to our audience um, and who we will be engaging um, from now on in the future. And I'll go ahead and close that poll in about uh, 15 seconds. And it looks like so far we have over 100 people viewing this webinar. Again, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, I'll go ahead and close the poll. And I'll share the results with you guys so that you guys can kind of know you know, who is viewing this webinar uh, alongside you. Um, so the results are here. And as you can see, it looks like we definitely have a lot of, a lot of advocates. Um, again, thank you for everybody that's uh, viewing this webinar and participating in this webinar so far. I'll go ahead and close that. Um, and so the next thing I wanna share with you all is um, who our partners are for this uh, webinar. We would like to thank the many partners who have contributed to this effort, including the Texas Council on Family Violence, uh, Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, Texas Legal Services Center, Lone Star Legal Aid, uh, Professor, Professor Angela Litwin, who is an advisor to the coalition and the many members of the TCCD Training Committee. Thank you so much for everybody that has participated and helped organize this webinar. We certainly wouldn't be able to do this without you all uh, and the impact you know, that everybody makes in this line of work. So we'll move on to the agenda of this webinar and what will be discussed. Um, the first thing is cohorts debt and the impact of uh, pandemic on financial abuse of DV survivors. Uh, the second section will be legal protections for victims of coerced debt. Um, third section, steps uh, DV survivors can take to protect themselves from coerced debt during the COVID-19 health and economic crisis. And then the last section will go over strategies to address coerced debt. So now, um, if you do have any questions during the presentations of this webinar, please feel free to click on the Q&A box that, should, uh, um, that you should have access to. Um, you can submit any comments or questions in that Q&A box, um, and we will be reviewing that throughout the webinar, and we'll try to answer questions um, as much as we can uh, throughout the webinar, but of course we will have a Q&A section at the end after all of the presentations um, and reserve time for that as well. So please don't hesitate to submit your questions or comments. Again, we'll be collecting that and uh, reviewing that and trying to answer that as we go along. Um, and now I will pass things over to our first presenter, uh, Professor Angela Litwin from the University of Texas School of Law. Thank you. Thank you, Christiane, for that introduction. Uh, 
Yeah, so my job today is to uh, introduce course debt, provide an overview, and um, talk a little bit about the expected effects from the pandemic. Um, so as many of you know, right, there's a relationship between debt and domestic violence, and that relationship is what my research team and I have coined the term coerced debt. Coerced debt occurs when the abuser and the abuser relationship obtains credit in the victim or survivor's name using fraud or duress. And this debt stays with the victim of course debt. Um, family court remedies are ineffective even if the survivor and abusive partner are married and they divorce and the family law court attributes the debt to the abuser because he was the one that incurred the debt, um, that does not change the survivor's contract with the creditor. Um, so she would still owe the money to the creditor. Um, traditional contract defenses such as duress are ineffective because the creditor is considered an innocent third party. It wasn't a part of the coercion or fraud. Uh, I'm gonna present uh, research from two studies. Uh, first, from the National Domestic Violence Hotline Survey that uh, I conducted with Adrian Adams, who's a professor at Michigan State University. Um, any statistics you see are from that. And then we've also conducted in-depth interviews with coerced debt survivors and any quotations you see are from that research. Um, our National Domestic Violence Hotline survey was about 10 questions um, and it was administered to English speaking female callers 18 and older. And we ended up with a sample size of 1,823. So we define course debt to include debt through fraud, right, sort of intimate partner identity theft, and also debt through coercion. Um, the reason we include fraud is that um, oftentimes the, uh, the fraudulent debt in an intimate relationship can be perpetuated by the abuse. So for example, if somebody discovers the fraud and then in, she's in an abusive relationship, she might not feel comfortable compute, uh, confronting the abusive partner because, um, because of the abuse in the relationship. So our survey, right? Um, first we asked, have you ever found out about debt or bills you owed that an intimate partner put in your name without you knowing, right? And that was our fraud question. And as you can see, a little more than a fifth of callers to the hotline said yes. And that's probably an undercount because people who had an ongoing fraud perpetrated against them would answer that question no. For coercion, we defined it in two parts based on how um, the academic literature thinks about coercive control, right? Coercive control is the type of domestic violence where one partner is basically trying to undermine the other partner's free will. And in that, there is a demand and then a consequence for not agreeing to the demand. So for us, the demand was, has an intimate partner ever convinced or pressured you to borrow money or buy something on credit when you didn't want to? And if a caller answered yes to that question, then we asked, what did you think might happen if you said no? And if she provided a consequence, then we counted her as having experienced coerced debt. And as you can see, 43% of people in our survey said yes to coerced debt. Um, it, but the types of consequences matter too. So a little over half of callers gave psychological consequences that could range from um, threats to reveal embarrassing personal information to name calling. Um, physical, it's pretty self-explanatory, and financial uh, consequences were things like not giving somebody grocery money or kicking them out of the apartment when they had no other place to go. And if you put this together, um, that people, callers who said yes to coercion or fraud, it was slightly more than half of our sample. 
We also, for sort of legal audiences, wanted to sort of narrow coercion to see how many would qualify under a stricter definition that a court might use. And so when we limited the coercion consequences to physical harm, we still found that nearly a third of our sample had experienced coerced debt. And then when we broaden physical harm to include um, everything that sort of rose to the level of duress, um, it was more than a third of our sample said yes to one form of coerced debt or the other or both. We also asked about one precursor of coerced debt, which is has an intimate partner ever kept financial information from you? And as you can see, nearly three quarters of people on the hotline survey said yes. And that was highly correlated with coerced debt, right? Women whose partners kept financial information from them were more than three times as likely to experience coerced debt. We also looked at three effects of coerced debt. Um, the most important is probably credit report problems. Um, and we asked if their credit score or credit report had been hurt by the actions of an intimate partner. Nearly half said yes. Another 14% said they were unsure. And to be conservative, we coded those as no. And as you can see, there's a really strong relationship. Women who reported her credit score, who reported coerced debt were more than six times as likely as other women to um, report credit damage. And credit, as many of you know, is now useful not only for getting loans, but for getting employment, housing, utilities, many basic necessities. We also looked at financial dependence, which we measure by asking if somebody had stayed longer in a relationship with someone who's controlling because the um, concerns about financially supporting themselves or their children. And as you can see, nearly three quarters said yes, a very sad finding. Um, and that was also correlated with coerced debt. Financial hardship, we couldn't ask about in our hotline survey because we didn't have room, but it came through loud and clear in our interviews. In the interest of time, I'll just share one quote with you. Um, this is somebody that uh, my research partner, Adrian, interviewed. She said, I think what this could have looked like had I not married him and the possibilities of where I could be financially and where I am now. I've always done a lot of volunteer work in my life. I used to go down to the soup kitchen in downtown Detroit before I met him once a month and help people make sandwiches and soup and serve the people and stuff. And never once did I think that that may be my future. Um, a pretty moving quote. Um, I've also been asked to give um, my thoughts about where, what might happen with coerced debt in the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and specifically, I think uh, the biggest thing that's having an impact now is the fact that much of the world is closed for business, right? As this little picture of the earth being closed shows. Um, in particular, everything that I've read is that experts predict um, dramatic increases in domestic violence because people are trapped at home um, with abusive partners and it makes it even more difficult to leave if you want to than it normally is. Also, you know, this virus is having a massive economic impact on American families, right? So you can see here in this slide um, in 2019, already many, many families were struggling, right? 37% said they could not cover a $400 emergency. Nearly half had no emergency savings. Um, and then you'll see now when job losses are surging, more than half of those who have lost a job um, say they could not handle an emergency of $400. So a, pure, a, a, a rapid increase. In addition, Black and Latino communities and those with lower education are disproportionately facing harm. So implications for coerced debt, as I mentioned earlier, abuse is likely increasing with survivors trapped at home. Um, as more families turn to credit, to weather these financial circumstances, we may see more financial abuse. And so for survivors, addressing coerced debt may become even more important than it already is. 
Um, one final thing, people who have heard me give this presentation before know that I've talked about these data a few times and might be wondering when we're getting new data. Uh, we have a grant from the National Science Foundation and are currently hard at work getting new data. And so that is coming soon-ish. In about a year, we hope to have um, completed our interviews. We were about to go into the field in March when the pandemic hit and we've had to completely restructure our, um, our, our survey because we were gonna interview people in person and now we have to interview them remotely, which changes a huge number of things. And so we need your help. Um, one issue is that the courts have been closed and um, divorce finalizations, we're getting people from divorce court records have been way down in Travis County. Um, so if you know of a Texas County, in addition to Travis, that has good online court records for family cases, particularly with attorney access to documents, um, please reach out to me. You can either write it in the Q&A or email me at alitwin at law.utexas.edu. And I believe our emails will also all be up there at the end of the webinar. So that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you for listening and for any suggestions. Thank you in advance for any suggestions you may have. Um, you should also feel free to ask questions. Now is a good time if you have any about this presentation. Um, and um, I'm going to turn it over. We're gonna have another quick poll. So please take a few seconds to fill that out. Thank you. See that for the vast majority of you who are seeing coerced debt, you see it in the context of credit card debt. So I'll make sure to touch upon that in the legal protection section on, on credit card debt. And um, a fair bit of you are seeing also on household utilities. Uh, that's the next one. And then um, there's 33% there's of you, the surprising me that says no. Um, so obviously I can't ask follow-up questions here, but maybe towards the end, um, I'll have some time to, uh, at the end of our presentation for Q&A to find out from you, those that aren't seeing it, um, what area of law you work in um, or you know, what services you provide. So my name is Carla Sanchez Adams. I am a managing attorney with Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. And I will be presenting on legal protections for victims of coerced debt. Uh, it's going to be a pretty broad overview, and I'm not going to be able to have a ton of time to go really in depth into each of these sections, but it'll give you an idea if you're assisting these victims uh, of coerced debt, what possible remedies they may have, and whether that means you're going to refer them to a legal aid organization, a private attorney, uh, or anything of the like, um, that will be uh, something that this will give you a good idea about how to do and to issue spot. Um, towards the end of it, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about um, economic impact payments and how um, uh, our clients may be affected by that and survivors and victims of coerced that may be um, affected by that. Feel free to ask questions again during the presentation. Someone's monitoring the, the Q&A and so they can uh, raise that if it's a clarification question, I said something or spoke really fast and you didn't understand. Um, otherwise, we'll get those questions towards the end. And ahead of time, I'm gonna apologize if you hear children screaming in the background, um, opening and closing doors. Um, I'm at my in-laws and we're doing our best to take care of the kiddos, but um, I'm gonna apologize ahead of time if you hear that. So let's jump on in. Um, one of the, the really amazing things that we have here in Texas, we are a, um, front runner in this area, kind of trailblazers, is that we now have protections for victims of coerced debt that no other state does because of a change recently, September 1st, 2019, to our law that defines identity theft. Um, and so this change was made to our penal code. And here's the section here of, of our penal code where you see that. And it uh, talks about how now, in, in order to um, be considered a victim of identity theft, the person who is stealing your identity um, it does it either traditionally, as, as Angie was talking about, through fraud, so you didn't know about it, you didn't consent to it, or this right here highlighted in red, uh, effective consent. And um, I will, next slide. So effective consent was the change in the law that was made and that uh, determined that even those who 
were induced to open this account by forced threat or fraud. So everything that Angie talked about, right, this duress component, this fear of consequence of, of if you say no, if you don't do this, dot, dot, dot will happen. So all of those um, um, clients and, and um, that you serve and that you see who traditionally didn't have the ability to get the remedies of an identity theft victim now will be able to if it happened after September 1st, 2019. So the law was in effect um, from that date forward. So if this happened before that date, you may be able to have some other remedies, but you won't have these of identity theft unless they met the traditional definition of identity theft. So this is incredibly um, powerful for us and for our clients because now that they, they will have some of these incredibly powerful legal remedies. So these are, you know, a little bit of a laundry list of, of, um, of protections that they'll have, and I'll go through each one, you know, superficially. But the most powerful is this 521 of the Texas Business and Commerce Code. Um, that is our identity theft statute, the civil one, um, that permits a victim of identity theft to get a court order um, that declares this person a victim of identity theft and is able to, in that court order, list all of the different um, uh, accounts or information um, that was subject to that identity theft. So that can include a car loan, a mortgage loan, um, even, you know, uh, credit card debt, all of these different things. And so it is, as, as we say here in our slide, the most holistic, holistic relief because um, in a lot of this work for those that operate in this work of identity theft space, it seems piecemeal. You're trying to dispute with these creditors and trying to, dis, um, you know, and, and then negotiate over here. This is a one-stop shop. You can get this court order and then um, it can't be contested. So of course, for any of you that have done this work, when you're trying to dispute it and do all these different things, they come back and say, well, sorry, um, you know, it's your name, it's your address, it's, um, you know, it's your social security, so it was you and we sent it to your house, so it was you. Um, and so that can be extremely frustrating for a survivor and for an advocate. And so this right here is a really powerful tool that, um, that now all victims of coerced debt post 9119 can get relief for. Um, the second is the this Fair Credit Reporting Act. And this, as Angie had mentioned, credit reporting is one of the most um, uh, seen negative consequences of coerced debt. Right, so the, the impact of that on credit and the inability to get housing, employment, uh, a car loan, all of these different things because of the negative impact of coerced debt is real. And so the Fair Credit Reporting Act is um, the federal law that provides for relief for those uh, that have um, you know, inaccurate information on their credit reports as a result of identity theft, uh, including other things. The identity theft protection um, is, is, you know, is really strong because you can get a block of all of that information so it will not appear on your credit report. In order to get that block, however, you either need to provide an, an, identi you need to provide an identity theft report, which is either uh, the FTC identity theft affidavit or a police report. Um, and so because our Texas law now has that change and we can get a police report under Texas law under that penal code section, um, then we can submit a police report when we may not have been able to do an FTC identity theft affidavit since that was traditional identity theft. And forgive me if I'm talking over anyone's heads if you're new to this area, when I say traditional identity theft, I mean it was just the person didn't know about it, didn't consent to it. Whereas now with this new definition of identity theft, they knew about it, but they were coerced into it. Um, so the next protection, um, legal remedies that these uh, victim, you know, victims of coerced debt may have is uh, pertaining to debt collection. So in our state, there's federal law and there's state law on debt collection. Um, our federal statute currently is stronger than our state statute in some ways, um, it is, but it only applies to debt collectors and not to creditors. Um, so if they're getting debt collection calls from a debt collection agency or letters, um, then, you know, they have the rights of um, under that federal statute. So some of those are, as you see here, being able to dispute the debt based on identity theft. Um, and they can request, you know, stopping collections, stopping calls, and they can't, you know, once they've been informed that this is as a result of identity theft and that it's disputed, 
then the debt collectors have to do certain things like stop the um, reporting or report it as, um, as disputed. Um, and they also have to stop collecting on it. They're not allowed to collect on it. Um, and so, you know, the failure to, to, to actually um, do this is, um, is, is good in one sense uh, for a survivor because they would have a legal claim against the debt collector. And so they would, you would want to refer them to a consumer attorney who could sue these debt collectors. Um, if they've been sued on a debt, then they have these defenses as well. Um, and then for our state law, creditors are also subject to our state law. So if a creditor is doing this, um, then she may have some protections as well. So the next part is with credit card debt specifically. This is only with credit card debt. Um, and there is a part of a federal law called the Truth in Lending Act that governs credit cards. There's one part of it that's the Fair Credit Billing Act that has to do with billing errors so that you know, charges that shouldn't be on a credit card. And there's another part of the Truth in Lending Act in this section that deals with unauthorized use of credit cards. So that's anything from opening a card and using a card that was never authorized or um, an existing card that the abuser used to, to make unauthorized charges. And so um, that's, this law is where you would find um, those different components and those different um, ways of disputing. Uh, the unauthorized use is pretty strong because it is there's no time limit on when you have to dispute with the billing errors there is um, and then it you know it, it also uh, limits the liability of of the um, of the victim uh, to fifty dollars uh, it depending on you know if they benefited from it or used it. And so I know I'm going super deep into this that you're like, I don't get it. I just want you to know that there are protections and that if you, if your client or survivor that you're helping has um, credit card issues, then um, it would be good to refer to a consumer attorney to help with that. So one important thing that you may hear if you are a um, working in the space is, well, sorry, they were married or sorry, they were in a relationship. And so you can't get any of these protections. And there's these cases here that say that's absolutely not true. So if you're a lawyer and when I go research these later, you'll have access to the materials, you can read them. But just as a kind of a brief um, you know, overview of them, essentially these courts are saying that's not enough. It's not enough for a creditor to say, sorry, you guys were married, so you're responsible for um, you know, your spouse's uh, unauthorized use. Um, this is not sufficient. There has to actually be an investigation. And there has to be consent. Um, so, th so the store owner, or whoever is, is, is um, giving out that credit, has to actually know that this person was authorized to, um, to, to be able to make those charges. Um, and then the, another kind of uh, protection that is overlooked often um, that, that we don't use enough is uh, there is an actual crime for credit card or debit card abuse. So if, um, you know, there's identity theft, but then there's also credit card or debit card abuse. And this is a, 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 a state jail felony. Um, and then, and so that's also a, a tool that we can use in, in helping advocate for our clients um, is, you know, if they're using and obtaining with the in, intent to benefit fraudulently a credit card or a debit card um, with the knowledge that it hasn't been issued to them and they don't have the effective consent. So again, effective consent is key here of the cardholder. So if it's done under duress or under threat of violence, then this is something that we can help our clients um, you know, by advocating to law enforcement. Um, another consumer statute, it's a federal law, it's the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, and this deals with um, unwanted calls or texts um, of trying to collect on a debt that's not theirs because they're a victim of identity theft. And um, this is also a pretty powerful statute and um, you can get you know, up to $500 per unwanted call. So that racks up um, and private attorneys take these cases. And so um, if, you know, this again, if, if you're, you're, uh, the survivor's coming to you and talking about all of these different issues, this is something that you can refer the um, client to a consumer attorney for. Lastly, I want to talk about the economic impact payment. So at this point, um, I'm going to assume that everyone's familiar with, with you know, what it is and, and how um, the different forms of getting it. But um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is once the payment has been um, uh, you know, dispersed, either deposited or sent by check, by mail, 
or um, you know, through a prepaid ca card that is now being uh, done in, um, as of last week. The IRS is supposed to mail a letter to the taxpayer's last known address within 15 days and let them know that it was the payment was made and how it was made. Um, and then how to report any failure to receive the payment. And so this is important, obviously, in the context of coerced debt because of, of how uh, a lot of times um, we see that tax debt is part of that coerced debt. It's not something that Angie talked about, but it's certainly something that we see um, in the context of, uh, you know, there's something for tax practitioners out there called innocent spouse. So if the couple was married and he forced her to sign all of these things and she didn't know anything about them and now she's liable for the tax debt, or, you know, the couple separated and he's still claiming uh, her when he shouldn't be or claiming the children, different types of fraud. Um, so if the you know, one of the things that I wanted to point to is right here, uh, the irs.gov website um, is, is a, a resource to go to if, you know, your client says, I got this letter, I don't know if it's the IRS, that's the first place you would go to. Um, another, uh, another important, um, per, it's not huge protection, but it's a way of reporting identity theft in the context of these economic impact payments. So if, um, he filed a return before she could or took her money or did something there was true identity theft um you know not coerced identity theft but true identity theft um, there is a way of reporting that to the irs so um, the ftc which is the federal trade commission they are traditionally that you know we talked about the identity theft affidavit they're the government agency their website is how you get that identity theft affidavit that's sufficient to request a block under the credit reporting act that's sufficient to get most legal protections um, according to the CFPB commentary. And so the FTC now, in addition to being able to report identity theft on their website, generally you can also do it for this EIP payments and they will automatically fill out a, an affidavit that it goes to the IRS. Um, and so here we have these steps, you go to their identity, you know, here's the blog that talks all about how to do that. But you go to the identitytheft.gov, that's the website for all identity theft victims to go to. Um, and it talks about, you know, now it has this, this page that which statement best describes your situation. Sorry, that's supposed to say you are not our. Um, and it says someone filed a federal tax return or claimed an economic stimulus payment using my information. And so that's new because IRS offices are closed before you had to submit paper application or paper affidavits. Now you can submit it electronically. Um, one of the best practices I wanted to, to highlight is um, to make sure if it's, if it's a, you know, if the survivor saying, well, there's, it's like more complicated, he did the return and I haven't done a return. Um, I, I highly recommend that um, if you're in the trellis service area to have them apply with us so our tax team can look at it. Um, you can also, if you're not in our, our service area, try to find if there's a low income tax clinic that is um, in your area, or um, you can also um, refer them to the taxpayer advocate um, and, and here's their website. If your client is going to be filling out that identity theft affidavit um, about the, the stolen EIP, then you wanna make sure to tell them to keep a copy of that for their file. So that wraps up my section. I don't know if there's questions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then, Anne, I'm going to um, see if there's any questions. Yeah, so there are two questions, Carla. The first question is about the new change in the identity theft statute and asking, has any been, one been successful in having a DA's office pursue this charge against an abusive spouse? I don't know if you know of any cases. So. Um, so the, the question, if it's post 9119, I don't. Um, pre 9119, the way that the law is written, it requires, um, in order for it to be prosecutable, is that a word? Don't know. But for them to prosecute on it, um, there has to they have to have done it to three people. So generally, if it's a um, an abuser doing it to our client, um, unless we know for sure the police investigate and find that he's done it to three other people they won't bring charges against them. That's why the credit card or debit card abuse is helpful um, because in that there isn't that same requirement for, th for that um, criminal charge. And there's one more question about the Chapter 521 action and a question asking if anyone has struggled in 521 actions with a home loan agency fighting back. 
So the, um, with the 521, um, you are supposed to serve or notify the creditors, but they're not actual parties to the suit. So um, you, you know, it's just the, the survivor and the survivor's attorney and the judge. Um, so we haven't, I have not yet had a case um, under the new law. Um, we are going to bring one um, pretty soon here, but there's no mortgage at issue in that case. Um, so I don't have any experiential knowledge about that. There is a fantastic attorney whose name is Paula Pierce. She's a private attorney. She was a former uh, TLSC attorney. She's in Austin and um, she does a lot of these. And so she may have um, the answer to that question, um, but I have not seen that with our cases. Um, so if anybody who asked that question wants to email me later, I can provide Paula's information or you can look it up uh, at the State Bar website. Thanks, Carla. Thank you. Okay, so if there's no more questions, I'll go ahead and pass it on. Great. So I'm, I'm gonna go to the next section talking about some steps that survivors can take to protect themselves from coerced debt right now. And it's, all of, all of these steps are profiled in a toolkit that the Texas Coalition on Coerced Debt published. It's at the website financialabusehelp.org and we'll have links to it in the resources, but I wanted to let you all know that that resource is available and a lot of the information comes from that resource. So a big part of thinking through what a victim of coerced debt can do is safety, of course, because a lot of the steps that we recommend people take to stop ongoing abuse or address ongoing financial abuse could spur additional physical, psychological, and other kinds of abuse. And so we're trying to, we try to be very careful in the information we provide to put safety first. But if someone is in a safe place, one of the most powerful things people can do to stop ongoing abuse, at least as it relates to credit, like credit cards or taking out loans, is to get a credit freeze with the big three credit bureaus. And this can often be done online, though um, that you can call by telephone. There may be some delays right now due to the coronavirus, but it's something that's very powerful. And if people need to get credit at a later date, theoretically, at least it's pretty streamlined to unfreeze it. It should be able to be unfrozen within an hour. And so it's a powerful tool to prevent identity theft in general, but also to the extent that an abuser has a lot of people's personal, someone's personal information, a way to stop new credit lines from being opened up in their name. Change existing account and card, password, and access information. Um, check, the, check your credit report. And this is a really important step to identify coerced debt. And each of these underlined words are actually hyperlinks and we'll be sharing this presentation. And so you can go to the specifics of the information on how to download free credit reports and how to check them for identity theft protect, um, abuses, transactions that the victim doesn't recognize because that's a key way that people who may not know that their identity has been stolen by an abusive spouse or loans have been taken out. It's a key way for people to find out. And then if people are in a safe place, file an identity theft affidavit with the Federal Trade Commission and or a police report. Oftentimes, based on the experience of attorneys, having a police report is really important in getting the credit bureaus to actually block these transactions as identity theft on the credit report. And it's why that the, the new law expanding the definition of identity theft is so important because it gives access to that level of protection to an expanded group of people with different experiences. And then finally, if people have the capacity, there's a process to challenge transactions due to identity theft with the credit bureau. Generally, they're supposed to respond within 30 days. With the COVID pandemic, that may take longer. The CFPB has given them a pass, at least on enforcement actions for complying with those deadlines. But these, these avenues are available and should be pursued now because people are going to be in financial hardship for a while. And if there's a possibility of cleaning up their credit so that they can have a clearer pathway to move forward in their lives, it's gonna make a, a big difference. So if someone is not safe yet, if they're still in an abusive relationship, if taking any of these steps will spur additional abuse, one of the steps that may be helpful is just for them to understand what, 
what constitutes identity theft in Texas in order to protect themselves from ongoing financial abuse. As Carla mentioned with the new law, using identity theft information, identity, identity information of another person without their consent or effective consent, so not only fraud but also coercion, is identity theft in Texas and it's important for people to understand that that's identity theft and also to understand that the victim cannot benefit from the debt. So if an abuser goes and buys a TV without using, using the victim's credit card, but then the, everybody at home uses the TV, that transaction, though not approved and perhaps um, you know, done under coercion, would not be considered identity theft. So just understanding this issue and credit and, and some of the ways they can protect themselves will be really important so that people are in a place to use these protections when the time is right. So a few tips, uh, just, I think it was just last week, there was an announcement from the Federal Trade Commission that from now through April, 2021, credit reports on annualcreditreport.com, which is the portal to access free credit reports, will be available weekly through all three bureaus, which is a great opportunity for people to keep track of their credit and to know what's really going on in a much more real-time basis than was previously available at no charge. Another thing that's really important is that individuals should not use debt management programs or other programs designed to clean up people's credit. We see this time and again in the wake of an economic crisis, these kinds of shady programs come out through the woodwork, they advertise on late night TV, and they promise these great things like, we'll get you out of debt, we'll be tough, we'll negotiate with your creditors. But what they end up doing often is leaving people in the same financial hardship or more financial hardship. And in the case of coerced debt, it, they could lose their ability to challenge the debts as identity theft. And so they would lose the main tool they have to address this coerced, the coerced debt that they didn't actually benefit from. Avoid taking out new loans that consolidate or refinance coerced debt. Sometimes people think it will make the debts more affordable to them, but once you take out a new loan, you lose identity theft protections that may have applied to the original loan. Avoid taking out high interest credit in any circumstance, but other loans like payday loans um, to make payments on coerced debt, these are just gonna leave people worse off and not address the underlying problem. And finally, with regard to bankruptcy, because you know, some, some consumer attorneys have, have an expectation, just given the economic situation, that we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies coming up, that people should be careful to file for bankruptcy and look at the debts. And if they're a victim of coerced debt, talk to an attorney and understand the different remedies for the different types of debts before moving forward with bankruptcy, just to make sure that they're not taking on liability for debts that really are coerced and should be um, not attributable to them because of identity theft. So the CARES Act economic impact payments, I'll just go over this really quickly. Carla talked about it. Just for the people who haven't gotten their payments yet, some of them may be getting a prepaid card or paper checks. Those are the two remaining forms. And just on the prepaid cards, I wanted to say a quick note, which is that people are getting these letters in an envelope that doesn't say IRS on it. It, it often says like the Money Network Cardholder Services, and some people have thought these are fraudulent. And so it's important for people to know that this is legitimate and real. There will be also frauds, but the IRS is sending out these payments in prepaid cards. And one of the tips that has been that has been given um, by national organizations is that people who get a prepaid card might want to hold on to it in case a new economic impact, impact payment is issued in the future. Also, just the IRS is going to be using the last address they have on file to mail these. So if someone hasn't received their payment yet and they have a wrong address on file with the um, US Postal Service, I mean, I mean, wrong address with the IRS, they should definitely change and forward their mail through the US Postal Service. And finally, that there are lots of options for, for free check cashing of these payments, HEB, Kroger, Randalls, and Tom Thumb, as well as some banks have announced that they'll cash these checks for free. So just important things to know. From a debt collection perspective, this money cannot be taken for IRS debt or money owed to the federal or state governments except for child support, but money deposited into an account can be taken for money owed to a financial institution and debt collectors if, they've already have, if they have authority to garnish an account. But there was a Supreme Court order that was issued and it's valid through August 12th 
that does protect these funds in the event that an individual's account is frozen by a debt collector, um, either through a, a garnishment or through a receivership. And, and though it's designed in a cumbersome way because when, when the account is frozen and the funds are seized, they have to challenge it through the court, but they created a, an expedited hearing process and a notice requirement. So people have a pathway to get their money back. It will be hard to do without an attorney, but just for people to know that that money um, is technically protected um, from, from garnishment um, by debt collectors. So uh, other pr credit protections, many of you know about these, but the CARES Act included mortgage protections, student loan protections, and many financial institutions are also offering certain opportunities for forbearance to delay loan payments if people can't afford them. From the perspective of coerced debt, I think it's important just to think about people before they use these different options. Just if these, any of these debts are coerced debts, except for the student loan um, forbearance, which it happens automatically, so they don't have to engage in any acknowledgement of the debt or other, other activity related to the debt, just to think through those impacts. So if somebody is getting forbearance, for example, on a credit card payment that they owe, it may be worthwhile to also challenge if there's coerced debt or if some of the charges are coerced to challenge those coerced debts at the same time. Because once these kinds of forbearances are accepted, it may, it's kind of a, it's a gray area, but it may make it more difficult to get some of these identity theft protections. And also just quickly, um, an, a problem that I've seen or a complaint I've seen from individuals who have gotten either overdraft fees waived by their financial institution or forbearance, um, two things, you know, people in asking for these have to say that, um, that the reason for their hardship is related to COVID-19. And that's what will spur a lot of these benefits. But the second thing is sometimes the terms are not so clear. So for, for example, a case came my way where an individual had their overdraft fees forgiven, so they were given the money back, and then 30 days later it was taken again. Because from the financial institution's perspective, they were giving them a 30-day reprieve and not forgiving it, but the individual thought it was being forgiven. So it's really important to understand the terms, to know how these any forbearance is going to be repaid so that people can expect, have, have a realistic expectation, but also to think twice before asking for this kind of forbearance on coerced debts if there's an ability to instead um, pursue identity theft remedies related to those debts. So just finally, you know, hope for a V, prepare for a W. I'm sure you all have followed a lot of the um, economic forecasts and you know, the V-shaped recovery is the most optimistic. Now that we're opening, everything's gonna go back to normal. But it's also quite possible that come November, December, there'll be a resurgence of the coronavirus and we'll be right back where we are. So anything people can do to prepare if there is a W, at least we have a little bit of advance notice. Some people have, may not have any capacity to do that because of their desperate situation. But where there's capacity, keep that in mind and plan for that W because if it happens, people will obviously be, be better off if they have a plan in place. And then these are some resources that we'll also be sharing and now I'll pass it to Stephanie who will conclude the presentation. Real quick, um, before Stephanie goes, there was a question, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with these um, organizations, but while you were talking about debt management companies, um, someone asked if um, Green Path or Transformance would be considered debt management. Are you familiar with those two organizations? So I'm not specifically familiar with them. I think that Green Path may be a consumer credit counseling service. And so nonprofit consumer credit counseling services are different than debt management companies. Um, you know, a good, a good rule of thumb, there are the HUD certified financial counselors and so the, and housing counselors, those are tend to be a good bet in terms of the legitimacy of the providers. And there's um, the, the housing and urban development website has, a, has information on, on accessing those individuals. But just to be careful about those kinds of services because many times they can leave people worse off. So, but we'll look up those companies and, and get back with you with some additional information. Thank you. 
Thank you, Anne. Um, so thank you everybody for being here with us today. Um, just to sort of bring everything together, uh, I prepared a case scenario for, for me to discuss. Um, in the interest of time, um, I am not going to be um, gaining the answers from you all, but I'll just be uh, running through some quick points of you know what we believe um, is important to do in these in these cases. Um, so usually what what I like to um, remind everybody is that we always want to keep a survivor centered approach when providing services to victims of domestic violence. And uh, with keeping that in mind, we never want our clients to feel um, overwhelmed by the information that you know we are providing to them regarding um, their financial situation. But at the same time, we also have the reality um, for, from what Angela described that 43% of people um, are of domestic violence survivors are also identifying um, that they're victims of coerced debt. And we also know as advocates and attorneys that um, really um, the financial stability of a client really determines whether or not um, that individual is going to be able um, to leave the relationship um, in the future. So keeping all of this in mind, it's really important to, to be open with our clients, but at the same time, we also want to provide as much information as possible with the end goal being that the client um, is, in, is in charge of her financial situation um, and we want her to make um, informed decisions. So our case scenario here um, starts off by uh, Sandra has been in a relationship with Ben. Ben was physically and emotionally abusive. After an explosive incident of violence, Sandra fled the home to a local nonprofit that provides services to victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. She is currently requesting assistance in, in obtaining a protective order. So what questions would we need to ask to determine um, whether there has been any financial abuse? So one thing I would definitely want to um, talk to the client is about is, you know, do you have control of your, of your own finances? Are there any accounts that, that you do not have access to? That's a pretty strong indicator of you know, whether the client has experienced financial abuse um, in the past or is experiencing it currently. Um, has an intimate partner ever kept financial information from you? I also like to ask whether they are aware um, of their partner having a separate mailbox, like such as a PO box, um, because usually abusers um, send the financial statements to that PO box address. So that's another question that as advocates and attorneys, we can ask our clients, um, you know, whether they've ever suspect, suspected that um, this individual is keeping information from them. Another question we could ask is whether an intimate partner has ever pressured them to borrow money or buy something on credit um, when, when they didn't want to. And of course, this this goes to identifying that co coercion element that we discussed. And did an intimate partner ever convince you to put household bills in, in your name? So, I mean, just getting into the practice of asking these, these just five questions about, uh, you know, whether there has been any financial abuse will really help us get a clear picture of what that client's uh, financial information situation is at the time that she is requesting our services. And I would like to point out that there are additional um, screening questions that attorneys and advocates can use in guide one of our toolkit. Our toolkit can be uh, found at www.financialabusehelp.org. So there's some more questions, um, sample questions for, for you there. So now let's add some additional facts to the scenario. We already know that Sandra and Ben are in a dating relationship and that she's wanting a protective order now from Ben. Um, Sandra now tells you that Ben has been harassing her for a while about wanting a new Mustang and he wanted Sandra to apply for the car loan. Sandra denied his request multiple times. Sandra discloses to you that back in January of 2010, Ben told you that he wanted her to accompany him to Austin to pick up a Mustang he wanted to purchase. Sandra agreed. While on the drive, Ben told her that he would need her to sign for the car. After Sandra protested several times, Ben told her that if she didn't sign, she was going to deeply regret it. When they arrived at the dealership, the car salesman told them that he had the paperwork ready. Sandra tells you that she eventually signed for the car. So what in additional information would we like to know here and what additional steps would we have the client take? 
Um, so first of all, I would definitely Stephanie. Begin by, yes. Hey, Stephanie, um, can you share your screen? Because you're not sharing it right now. and We can't see that fact pattern or any of the slides that you were showing. So we finished part one. I'm sorry that you couldn't see the fact pattern. Um, but here's the fact pattern uh, for part two, where we have the additional information that um, that there is now this car loan that Ben uh, wanted her to sign, but she refused. Um, and when they arrived at the car dealership, the salesman told them that he already had the paperwork ready. And she eventually tells you that she did sign for the car. So what additional information would you like to know? So you definitely want to know whether the client has ever pulled a copy of a credit report and reviewed it for any inaccurate information. Um, and like we mentioned before, the best uh, place to get the credit report is at www.annualcreditreport.com. And um, there is also additional information about this step in our toolkit. Um, does the client have, have any documents? This is gonna be extremely important because we want to know what type of loan it was um, and um, what the client's contractual obligations, if any, are in regards to this vehicle. Um, so any purchasing agreements that she may have, um, any documents that the client um, can get her hands on uh, is going to be really helpful um, in this case. And we also want to know uh, whether the client has ever used the vehicle um, and where the vehicle is now. This information is important because um, it, if the client has used or benefited from the vehicle, um, she may not be able to assert some of the identity theft protections that um, a, a normal victim would normally be able to assert. So that information is definitely important. Um, and another thing that's important here is what the client's goals are in regards to the vehicle. Um, the first fact that I mentioned in part one mentioned that she, the client was also requesting a protective order. So for example, if the client's goal is to eventually get this uh, vehicle back in her possession, she may be able to request that relief as part of the protective order. So again, it's important to identify what the client's goals are earlier rather than later with regard to any um, coerced debt because we may be able to address some of these at least um, until the client is able to dispute these directly with the, with the creditors. And that's pretty much what I mentioned. So part three of the scenario, um, in this part of, so you keep talking to, to your client, you help the client pull her Experian credit, credit report, and you find that a credit card was opened in May 2019 um, without her knowledge or consent and that there is a balance of $4,000. And Sandra wants to know if she should make a payment on that debt. The additional fact that we have is that she also tells you that she shares a bank account with with her abuser, and um, that then that the coronavirus economic impact payment went to that shared account, and that Ben immediately withdrew it once it was deposited into the account. So, what additional information um, do we want to to know here? Um, so, first of all, in regards to the credit card, we do generally advise clients to not make any payments on any debts that were obtained. Um, without their authorization or, or consent. Um, one of the, the speakers did mention though, that um, in light of the, the coronavirus, um, some of the creditors are um, offering a sort of some type of forbearance relief um, for debtors. Um, so if the client wants to ask for that sort of relief as she's discovering this now, it's important to also advise her to go ahead and start the dispute, dispute, dispute process um, with, the, with the credit card company at that time. Um, so we definitely want to start the dispute process as soon as possible, um, and this of course entails filing the, um, preparing the uh, identity theft affidavit or, or police report, but we definitely want to do this after um, we've obtained a really good picture of what the financial situation is. Um, the case scenario mentioned that she was only able to get her Experian report. So we definitely want to help our clients um, get 
copies of the other two credit reports from Equifax and TransUnion to make sure that there are no um, unauthorized accounts on those reports as well. Um, that way the client only has to make uh, or prepare one identity theft affidavit or, and or one police report um, to be able to um, begin the dispute process. And of course, um, as Carla mentioned, the dispute process does entail, um, we prefer that the disputes uh, be in writing um, to, to the creditors or whoever is um, attempting to collect the debt. And there is more information about how to um, begin this process um, and in guide four of, of, of our toolkit. And in regards to the economic impact payment, um, one thing that we definitely need to know is what type of account it is. And for that, uh, we ask for our clients to get a copy of their bank agreement. Um, so depending on their bank, they should be able to either download it off of their um, online account, or they can ask for a copy of the agreement in person. Um, but the copy of the bank agreement will allow us to identify what type of bank account it is, you know, whether it's a joint bank account or um, whether it's just, it was just um, straight up theft where um, you know, he somehow obtained access to the client's debit card and would do this without her knowledge or consent. So that's gonna be really important because um, we think it's gonna be harder to make the case if it's a joint bank account um, that, that, it was, that it was theft. I think that's, um, that's a little bit more uh, of a difficult um, fact pattern. Um, so with that, I will go ahead um, and turn it over to Christian. Okay. So, um, of course, this is where we encourage you all to submit any additional comments or questions, uh, especially in regards to all the presentations you just uh, saw. Um, and Carla will take over uh, shortly um, to answer those questions. Um, but here you do have some information. So if you are interested in joining the Texas Coalition on Coerced Debt, uh, please feel free to email uh, us at texascoalitiononcoercedat at gmail.com. Um, a great uh, resource and tool is the uh, Coerced Debt Toolkit. Uh, so please be sure to check that out if you haven't done so already. Uh, it can be found at financialabusehelp.org. Um, and then of course, for all the presenters that presented uh, during this webinar, their contact information is down below. Again, feel free to reach out to anyone um, for any additional information, resources, or interest in the Texas Coalition on Coerced Debt. Um, they'll be more than happy to answer your questions and assist uh, you all individually as much as they can. Um, and then uh, after the Q&A section that Carla will be facilitating, um, there will be an, another poll, a final poll, uh, to gauge you know, how we can improve and um, address any you know, future interest uh, in additional webinars. So feel free to um, answer that poll um, at the end of this webinar uh, and provide us any feedback. Um, so that we can make sure that any future webinars um, include uh, the information that you all are interested in. So I'm going to go ahead and switch it over to Carla so that she can um, facilitate the Q&A. And then again, after the Q&A, we'll go ahead and launch that poll. Thanks, Christian. So right now we have two questions. One question is, if the abuser turned in the car title to a car title loan company, so similar to payday lenders, but essentially they use the title as collateral, and he didn't make any payments and the car um, was repossessed, um, is there any way she can get the car back? So this is difficult to answer because more information is needed. Is she on the title as well? Um, if she is, Presumably, they can't. They are not allowed to uh, take out a loan if it's just in um, if it's in both of their names. If it was just in his name, then she, he can unilaterally do that, and no, she won't have any legal right to that car. Um, of course, it depends on if there's a divorce decree or something else that gave her possession of the car. Um, still, the title company would likely have superior title, and it would be very difficult for her to get it back. Um, again, if they were 
both on the title, then there is probably a legal claim that can be made that she wasn't, there was no consent. She was, she didn't sign to it. She didn't know about it. Um, and if her signature is on there and if, and he forged it then fraud. Um, so it depends on, um, obviously on the specific facts of that uh, situation. Uh, does anybody else, um, any of our other panelists have additional comments on that? I'll take that as a no. Uh, the next question is, what if the client hasn't left their intimate partner? Wouldn't filing a police report cause problems? What should they do if they're not ready to leave, but they want to repair their credit? So yes, um, that was one of the things that Anne talked about, that safety is one of our primary concerns, obviously. Um, and there's two components to safety. There's a physical safety, but there's also obviously economic safety, because as we know, um, people won't leave uh, if they uh, have nowhere to go and are economically insecure. So um, we, in our toolkit, we talk about all of those different things and those considerations and how to become physically safe first. If she's not ready to leave, um, you're going to have a huge challenge with filing a police report, absolutely. Um, the, if they wanna repair their credit, um, that, that term, I, I try to, to shy away from that term um, and discourage people from using that term because it is a legal term um, that that pertains to a credit repair organization and credit repair is basically, you're saying, yeah, it's mine, it's messed up, I need to fix it versus this isn't mine, it's inaccurate, it shouldn't ever be on there. Um, so one step is to prevent future coerced debt, even if she's not leaving, is to prevent future coerced debt. And that could be by getting a security freeze, which is what Ann talked about. Um, and you can find more information about that on our toolkit or you can email any of us about it. Um, and the other thing is to, um, you know, to just be able to know what is on her credit report and what is in, on that um, is as a result of coerced debt where she may be able to, to, to dispute and get that removed or blocked um, and what is hers. And if some of that um, is, uh, you know, is not hers, then figure out are there timelines? So um, is, when does it need to be disputed? When does it need to be reported? Some of those things and talk through that with her and let her know, um, you know, you're gonna lose these protections if you don't dispute it within this certain time period, but you have this time period to decide what you wanna do. Um, and again, being survivor-centered means that if they wanna stay for whatever reason, um, then, you know, they, they can, but here are the consequences, um, you know, economically and legally. Um, so, of course, it's up to them, but informing them of, of what, you know, those consequences are. Um, I have another question. Why don't y'all um, go ahead and um, fill out, for those of you that can, um, this, this, this poll, uh, which should say information for future training. Um, and I'll read the next question, which is, what about mortgage loan divorce papers? Um, I think they say it was supposed to leave the responsibility to the spouse, however, did not make payments and it went to court. Now victim is left with bad credit and the thousands in debt. So I'm assuming that this means that the husband was supposed to make payments, um, even though the wife was awarded possession of the home um, and he didn't make the, pay the payments. Um, so she's a bad credit, thousands in debt. Presumably if this is, um, if, if her credit is on it as well. So the question is who was under the, the promissory note um, and the actual loan of the mortgage? Just him or her or both? Um, if it was just her, then this is why we advise a lot of our clients at the time of divorce um, that you know, even if he's awarded the debt and he's supposed to pay, at the end she is ultimately responsible. So she needs to make those payments. Um, and um, if he doesn't and she wants to keep the home, she could go after him in, in family court, you know, for, do a motion to enforce or whatever. But at the end of the day, she's going to have to be responsible. Um, if it's only his name that's on it, then she won't, she'll lose the home, but it won't impact her credit. Um, if both names are on there, then both of them will be negatively impacted. Um, she would have, if, her, if it's solely her name or if it's joint, then she will have some protections. I, I recommend um, contacting a consumer lawyer who knows how to work with mortgages, you know, you can get currently, you can do forbearance options depending on if it's a federally issued lo um, uh, loan. Um, and uh, there is also some, you know, uh, loss, uh, uh, basically loss mitigation procedures um, that you can do to try to become current. You can refinance or certain things that can happen, but a lot of this are, is fact specific on, um, you know, 
whose name is on it. So this isn't necessarily a coerced debt question because obviously if it was coerced debt, um, then she, I mean, she was forced to sign the loan or something like that. Um, then, then that is also going to be a different uh, question, and it's going to be going back to when did that happen? Was it before 9119? There may not be any um, remedies. So, um, if you have further questions and want to con a consult on that, feel free to do so. Um, so, hopefully, everyone else answered. There's no other open questions. I know we ran a little bit over. Thank you guys for those of you who stayed um, and are still with us. Uh, please fill out that information about our poll. Um, I don't know if we have anything, if there was more than one poll question. Um, but if not, then that is all. Please feel free to email us um, and join our community. And if you have other questions, and again, this is recorded and you will get an email, I believe, with the recording and our materials. Anything else that I'm missing, Christian? No, I think we covered it all. So again, thank you all for joining this webinar. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and we look forward to uh, future webinars to cover any additional information that you all are interested in. Um, as you can see here uh, in the poll, the results, um, we got some good feedback from you all. Uh, and so we're happy to continue uh, these uh, discussions and engage you all on you know, the work that you all are doing. So thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us.